ASMR review show. For this video, I'm going to be doing a review of the long-awaited and highly anticipated new Tool album, Fear Inoculum. A record that we've been waiting about 13 years for, so uh, it's been quite some time. Uh, those of you who are unaware, uh, Tool, they're a sort of prog metal, grunge metal type band, uh, very pretentious, which is why I like them, uh, from the early 90s, and their most recent release until this point was the album 10,000 Days, and that was all the way back in 2006, and ever since then, there has been constant speculation as to when the band would finally release another album, and we had many leaks and rumors about potential album release dates and things like that, and it seemed as if it might never really happen, but lo and behold this year we got some real news and we actually got real info and now we finally have a real album here fear inoculum and this is a review but it's also more just kind of a general rambling of sorts about the album because i find it hard to get an exact stance on music after only a few listens or a certain amount of time. Uh, while Tool might be my favorite band, I'm sure a lot of the songs that I love now I originally didn't, didn't connect with as much. Like, I know the song Reflection off of Lateralis. I love that song now, but when I originally heard it, I kind of felt it was a little long, drawn out, and boring, and didn't really care for it. But over time, as I listened to it more and got more into all the little intricate details of the song, uh, I gained more appreciation for it. So that's just one example. There are many songs that I can think of where I've had experiences like that. So, my view on the album might change over time, but for now it's just going to be what I think of it in the moment. I'll try to keep it as objective as possible. I am a major Tool fanboy, but I don't want to just, you know, say, well, they made an album, so now it's amazing. I have to love it. So, this here uh, is the uh, deluxe limited CD packaging that they released. Uh, I pre-ordered it as soon as it came out, because I knew this would not be something that would last. And um, the art is mostly by Alex Gray, longtime collaborator. A side note, if you hear any snoring, one of my dogs is back there. There's a bit of a thunderstorm earlier, and I just want him chilling there just to relax. You know, because we care about dogs and stuff, and they're cute and adorable. Um, so, there's a lot of other artists that collaborated with this, and I love uh, the record packaging. First off, I'll show you. There's this plastic wrap that was over the album, just with this saying, uh, the long-awaited new Tool album, but well, it may be hard to see. I like that this Tool logo, actually, if you fold it in half, as many have pointed out, it becomes a syringe of sorts. And that ties in with this theme of this album title, Fear Inoculum. It's about making yourself immune to fear, I believe. 
or something like that. So, um, I know when the initial album cover was shown, some people were a little underwhelmed, but I didn't let that sort of affect my opinion right away, because if you look at just the album cover of most Tool albums on like iTunes or something like that, like the 10,000 Days album cover alone, good, not really that amazing. But when you see the actual CD and it has these 3D glasses and these cool pictures that like you look through the glasses and they're in 3D, it's just, it's a really neat way to design CD packaging. So I knew that they were going to do something special for this, and they have. Because there's this logo on the back. And there's three different ones, apparently. Uh, I'm gonna have to turn the audio down for you here because it's gonna play music when I open it. It's like there's a video screen and this drone track that plays along with this moving artwork. And it's really interesting. So, first we have more of the spiral of eyes, and this is part of a piece by Alex Gray called The Great Turn. And we open this up, and uh, this is what we see. Also has a button that you can pause and change the volume on it uh, and I'm not gonna have the whole thing play out right now you could uh, look that up if you want but this drone song that plays it's essentially track zero for the album because it's not actually part of the album but it's this weird synthy ambient thing that I guess you could consider part of it in a way so, uh, it's not something you necessarily would watch while you're listening to the album, but it's just, it's cool. It adds a lot to the, the experience, and I always appreciate bands that do a lot of cool artwork, uh, especially from Alex Gray, and I think it was a really neat way to design CD packaging. And inside we have a booklet with more art and lyrics, which is interesting because uh, Tool never really had lyrics printed in their albums before. More of this figure, again, I believe part of the great turn. More lyrics. Art. This piece, I believe, is uh, called The Torch and I've seen this on a lot of promotional material and this was also shown at tool shows leading up to the release of the album. Uh, there's also these nice sort of portraits of the band, that's Justin Chancellor, Danny Carey, a sort of full piece of The Great Turn Maynard James Keenan. And Adam Jones. So, there's a lot of great graphic design to this. I think it's really cool. But, enough about the art. You want to hear how is the music? How is it? Well, it depends on what you want from this album. See, Tool is a band that has mixed things up across each album. You could look at stuff from OP8, their first EP, 
and compare that to some of the stuff from the most recent album, 10,000 Days. And you'd be wrong to say those are made by two different bands, but also they are still very distinct in the phases of time that they were made. Uh, it's hard for a band to sound the same and yet different each time on the album. And yet, I think Tool is one of the bands that manages to do it. And nowhere I think is that more obvious than on Fear Inoculum. Uh, this is not in the same style of Opiate, or Undertow, or Anima, or Lateralis, or 10,000 Days. This is in the style of Fear Inoculum. And what I mean by that is, it sounds like Tool, but just slightly different than previous Tool albums. And again, you could say the same about every other release. Uh, a song like Right Into on 10,000 Days, I think, was an indicator of the direction they were going to eventually go. And they definitely did on this album. And that song, you can see that they were working towards that style. Um, the live version of Push It on the uh, Slaval, Salaval, however you say it, album. Uh, closely resembles what eventually would become the style of the song right in two. So they've always been going a certain way and working towards a certain sound. And I think Fear Inoculum represents the point that they would have ended up at. So it's consistent. I don't think it's out of left field. But it didn't feel like just, you know, repeating the same old things. So I liked that element thing that could be a bit of a turnoff for some people is that uh, on your average Tool album, you'll have a couple of short, quick, punchy songs. Uh, songs like Intolerance, Stink Fist, 46 and 2, Schism, Parabola, Vicarious, Jombie. Uh, those are shorter songs compared to the average Tool song, and usually a bit more simple in the song structure, a little more straightforward, um, more adherent to the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, end structure. And just all about a little more catchy or accessible. Like, you know, Schism is a song you could, like, potentially hear on certain rock radio channels. And they put some of those songs in Guitar Hero. That's where I first discovered Tool. But then, they also have the longer, drawn-out, experimental, epic songs. Like, Disgustipated, or Third Eye, or Ten Thousand Days. And then they also have a bunch of weird, random, experimental interludes that are usually just fun little companion pieces to uh, the main song, little breathers or appetizers for the main course. And it's just something to break up the flow of the album a little bit. And that's to be expected. So. Fear Inoculum, the album, has a few interludes, and it has some long epic songs. And that's it. Unlike previous albums, where there were short songs and long epics, every major song on this album is a long epic. And that stylistically is not going to appeal to a lot of people. That's the way the album is, is it's all long, slow, build-up, drawn-out epics. As someone who likes those songs and that style, I 
totally okay with that if we just have a whole album of that. But for some, it's going to be a little boring, a little drawn out, and feeling like it lacks the catchiness, attention factor. So I do recognize that as being something that some would not like. It's kind of funny, the shortest song proper is the drum solo that Dan and Carrie gets. You know, again, not really an actual song. Um, every song on this album that's an actual song is over 10 minutes. So, I'm okay with that, but not everyone will be. So, let's start going uh, track by track, uh, if we will. Uh, I'm just going to get the proper track list pulled up right now. So what I like about the way that they did this album is that the full digital version has the extra interludes added because the whole album would not fit on one CD. It's already 79 minutes. And when you add the extra interludes, that becomes 85 minutes. But rather than needlessly split into two CDs, they just simply said, okay, the main songs will be on the CD, the interludes will be available digitally, and when you buy the physical album, you get a download card as well. So I thought that was nice. It's um, a lot easier than having to add two CDs to it. And I really hope that's not a trend bands do, like, if you want to talk about that, I really didn't like how Metallica made their most recent album, Hardwired to Self-Destruct, two CDs, even though it all fit on one CD and was shorter than an album they previously released as one CD, that album being Load. And if they did it to, like, break up the flow more because it was overwhelming, then I don't really think that's a valid reason, but we're talking about Tool, not Metallica. So, first song proper and first released track was the title track, Fear Inoculum. And this one, I felt, was the most familiar sounding, and I think that's why it's the first song. It kind of eases the listener back into the sound. Um, and the first half of the song has a bit of a normal structure to it. Uh, it's got a nice build with some uh, guitar riff, a guitar riff that's like uses the uh, the volume knob to sort of have these volume swells. Uh, the bass holding down a steady beat, and this is also the start where you realize that Danny Carey on drums is going absolutely insane. I've always loved his drumming, and I think with with this one he just managed to just go absolutely crazy. He really wanted to push what he was capable of doing, and maybe he had extra limbs surgically attached. I, I don't know. It seems to be the only explanation for this. So, this is when we also realize that uh, Maynard's vocals, he's got more of a clean, softer approach to it. Um, the aggressive, harsh yelling that was present in mostly their older albums, and to some extent the later ones, that's not here at all. So, unfortunately, if you are looking for some really great Maynard yells, and some screams, and some anger and metal, uh, you will not find that here. I think the closest we get to something like that is the verse of the song Tempest, or the final lyrics to the song Calling Voices. And, well, it is a little disappointing to not have that. It's a stylistic choice, and I can respect that they decided to do what they wanted, not necessarily what people wanted to hear. They made the album they wanted, so I respect that. And then the song, halfway through, transitions to a riff with a guitar tone kind of similar to the beginning of the song Push It. 
and it goes into this odd signature. They jam around with it for a bit. It ends on this nice climax with a very sweet sounding wall guitar solo from Adam Jones and a nice little chugging unison riff from the band to end it all off. And it's interesting because uh, a complaint that I heard about this album was that I had felt that Maynard's parts were sort of lazy or half-assed, that he only sings for the first half of the songs and the second it's all instrumental and he doesn't bother throwing in any more lyrics. But really, out of the six main songs, the only song that actually doesn't have vocals near the end, where the second half is entirely instrumental, is the song Descending. Other than that, every other song he does come back in for a bit, so I don't really understand the complaint there. And that's the first song. And it's interesting because it might be the weakest one, but I think it's still, it's still pretty interesting. So that brings us to the second main song, which is Numa. And this is one that I think a lot of fans have been really enjoying. And there's a lot to like about it. The start kind of makes me think of like Schism meets The Patient. Uh, it's got sort of a main punchy bass riff to it. Uh, and uh, the way the guitar fades in to really get distorted for the uh, chorus riff. Though there's no lyrics to this chorus. Uh, it reminds me of the main guitar entrance in The Patient, how it starts off very melancholic and slow and then really punches in with a nice, nice meaty guitar riff. And then partway through, the song kind of starts building on this riff with, um, I don't know if it's a tableau or um, just some sort of electronic drums, but basically Dan and Carey is like building on these really weird drum sounds, very uh, sort of tribal sounds. And the band builds on this riff for a while. This part now reminding me of the song Right In Two. Again, I felt that was going to be indicative of their direction, and it was. Until finally we go back to another verse, but with more punchiness, and uh, one final uh, bit of that big chorus riff. I think this song has most fan appeal uh, because it feels the most uh, like familiar. Fear Inoculum felt like easing you in, and then Numa felt like a proper return to form. So it was good to have both those as the first songs. And if we're listening to the album digitally, uh, there's the first interlude, uh, Litani contra la pure, which is French for a fear against litany, I believe. And it's just a little like keyboardy type weird synthy solo, which was actually played during the intermission of their most recent tour. So it's interesting that they snuck a secret interlude into the set uh, without people realizing it was actually going to wind up on the album. And then that brings us to the next main song, which is Invincible. This is one that they debuted uh, during the most recent tour. And I really dig this song a lot. Uh, it's got a very complex sounding riff uh, from Adam Jones. And like most songs, it builds on that for the first half, sets up a nice sort of punch and verse to it. Uh, in the second part, it then slows down to this uh, chugging riff, kind of reminiscent of the main riff of Jambi. There's a really very nice bass solo over top of it, too, uh, where Justin Chad's where he goes like full on distortion, uh, similar to his bass solo in The Pot or Schism. I always love it when a bass player brings out some nice distortion and some wah. And after it builds in that for a while, uh, it goes back into the 
sort of fast first. There's a lot of energy uh, when it goes back into it. Um, one of my favorite crescendos in the tool song, that's for sure. And then it just ends on a nice couple of really good hits. So that's one of my favorites off the album. Really dig that. Really like that. Uh, and then there's another interlude that is a Legion Inoculant, which is a very echoey drone sort of sound. Um, bass in that really vibrates everything as well. It's very nice. But it's basically more of a segue into the next main song, which is Descending. And Descending starts off with um, about a minute or so of like oceans and waves. So coming into that from Legion Inoculate, giving you that breather after Invincible, it really feels like you're building up to something intense. Especially since Descending was a song they were teasing since like 2015, I think, at least. I saw them live in 2017, and they were doing the short instrumental version of Descending on that tour. But now we get the full version, the full experience, and I think Descending might be my favorite song on the album. I know that's not a popular opinion. I just, I love the intensity of the first half. Uh, I feel like there was a lot of passion behind it, like they were really trying to make something good and intense, and they felt real pushed to, to do their best and put out a good performance because of the high expectations and the whole waiting 13 years and all that. Um, and then the second half is entirely instrumental, but I like that it just gives the band a chance to shine. because. I think uh, good instrumentation is always important to recognize, and uh, it's just the band rocking out and jamming on some riffs. There's a nice synth part. Kind of reminds me of uh, near the end of The Grudge. There's also a really nice slide solo in this song, and it's just an all around real great experience. I really, really dug this song. Just the whole build up to it just gave this real grandiose epic vibe and I really dig that. And then after that uh, is the song Culling Voices. This one was definitely, I felt, the most uh, different sounding out of the album. Uh, it's the most quiet song. Um, the sort of build doesn't happen until near the very end. And stylistically, I don't know, there was something about it that reminded me of uh, Sigur Rós, uh, perhaps because it's in the key of B, and that made me think of the Sigur Rós song, I believe it's pronounced Ni Batali. It's off of the second album, Aishis Desperation. My, my Icelandic is not what it used to be, I'm sorry. But in any case, that one is very good as well. The riff at the end, where it builds to, may be a bit simplistic uh, of a choice, but it's overall pretty effective, I'd say. So I like that one as well. And that brings us to Chocolate Chip Trip, <laughs> which is such a great, fun song title to say. And what that is, as I previously mentioned, it's a Danny Carey drum solo. And uh, this was something he would do live on the set lists. It was listed as CC Trip. Basically, on his um, little old fashioned synthesizer keyboard thing that he has on the side of his drum set, he would set up a little weird synthy loop just to repeat. Uh, and then he'd go to the main part of his drums and slowly work in and build up a really nice sound in your solo and just have at it. And so now on this album we have a studio version of that. It was really cool as well because usually live he would always like, try to make something original and keep it unique. And now we have 
sort of a uh, main version of it. And uh, if you ever thought not much of uh, Danny Carey, uh, you need to listen to Chocolate Chip Trip because it's basically like his version of Rat Salad or Moby Dick. It just goes absolutely crazy and I love it. It's great. Uh, and that brings us to the last main song on the album, Tempest, but it's stylized with a 7 as the first T, so I guess it is technically 7 Tempest. Maybe. And this was one that a lot of people were hyping up for it being over 15 minutes. And while I do really enjoy it, I don't know if it's my favorite. Again, I think that might be descending. So, Tempest is actually a very simple song in terms of its concept. Uh, the song has a nice little weird beginning to sort of get you in the mood and when the main riff kicks in I think it's actually a riff back from like Undertow because I just pictured the Undertow album cover in my head when listening to it and all of a sudden I was back in 1993 just listening to Undertow for the first time not that I was you know listening to Undertow in 1993 that was when it came the most uh, old school sounding in terms of the riff um, but of course the inflection of the vocals and everything that's a little bit different because of Maynard's different style of singing so after the sort of setup to the song um, they start playing this very long jamming riff and Adam Jones he just solos for like about four minutes straight I heard a review saying that he did in one song, but I thought that was an exaggeration, but uh, it's not. <laughs> and I realized part way through that Tempest to me feels like Tool if they were trying to do some kind of Grateful Dead sort of um, just, you know, long drawn out experimental jam of uh, some sorts, just like a big uh, improv thing with a crazy solo on top. I'm totally okay with that. And yeah, there's a couple of um, vocal interjections from Maynard here and there, but bulk of the song is a is a pretty long guitar solo with just a lot of uh, riffing and um, jamming out. And again, if uh, any member of Tool wants to just take time to just solo around and mess around on their instrument, they can go ahead and take as much time as they want because they're all really great musicians and. I'd love to hear that. So, after that it builds to a nice crescendo. Maybe not as um, epic as some of the other moments on this album or previous Tool songs. I mean, let's face it, no Tool songs got anything on the ending of Lateralis. That's pretty much where it's at. And uh, then finally it goes into one last little interlude called Mocking Beat which is just like some nature sounds and some loops and just a little random thing to end the album. And let's be real, I think apart from Third Eye, uh, when has Tool ever ended an album in a normal way? You got Gaping Lotus Experience on Opiate, a hidden track taking place six minutes and six seconds into the sixth song on the album. So. You've got Disgustipated's weird crickets and phone recording. Uh, then you've got Fapedoid's Art Bell radio recording and noise drum solo. Uh, and then you've got uh, Vigente Tres's weird like sound effects and the voice of God uh, telling us to ascend. So uh, if Mocking Beat is the end of the album, then Again, I don't think it's the weirdest way that they've ended an album on. They've done a lot of weird trolling and stuff when it comes to that. So, that is all of the songs on the album. So, overall, I really dig this album a lot. I mean, I 
try not to have any expectations for it because, you know, after a while you build something up so much. I mean, what is it going to be like Duke and Duke forever? Where it's in development for 12 years and it ends up being absolute garbage. Right? No, I wouldn't say that. And, I mean, you know, hey, they beat Half Life 3, so that's pretty good. Though it would have been funny if this was actually the soundtrack. So, as to how it compares to other Tool albums, though, I don't know if I really want to get into that discussion at this point. Because with every other Tool album, I've had over 10 years to uh, listen to all of them and, you know, really digest them. And they've been in crucial and important moments in my life and for growing up. Right, the music you listen to when you're growing up is, uh, I think, very you know, indicative of what kind of person you'll be and what will stick with you for your life. And all the other two albums have those moments for me, but this one hasn't because it's come out at such a different time. It's like I've seen comments from some people saying, like, last time Tool came out, right? I like didn't have a wife and three kids and a house and a car and everything like that. And yeah, a lot could happen in that time. So I have to wait to give this album more time to like, I guess, see how it affects me in my life if that makes sense and isn't so pretentious, you know. I mean, you know, if, if you really wanted me to give like my first gun to the head, sort of like, give me an answer now. I don't like it as much as Lateralis or Arma, obviously. Probably on par with 10,000 Days, at least. Um, though that might be a controversial statement because everyone says 10,000 Days is their weakest, and I wouldn't agree with that. I actually really dig the hell out of 10,000 Days. Um, like, I like all of those more than OP8. Um, and then also more than Undertow. So I. I think I like this more than Undertow, which again, I know some people, they like the old school tool sound. They like the, the fast aggression and, uh, and the grunge and, and the, the 90s rage, they like that. Not so much the, the weird proggy math stuff. Um, so, and I like the weird proggy math stuff, so you know, this, this is more in line with that. Right? Tool's been going in a progression, they've been going to a certain place. And they're not going back. They're looking forward. They're still keeping some elements of what they like, but the overall sound is new. So, overall final thoughts. I really dig this album a lot. I really like it. I've been listening to it nonstop. I'm gonna keep listening to it. Love the packaging. Can't wait for the vinyl release. Hopefully, maybe reissue on the wall right so I can get something to complete this collection here. But also I understand why some people have been a little let down with this and not really interested. Um, you know, stylistically it's um I wouldn't say it's like anything that really brings more to the genre that we haven't heard. Um, it's not a game changer, really. But Anima and Lateralis were game changers. This is not, so if you're looking for innovation or experimentation, I don't think you'll find it here. And again, if you want the old school, quick, punchy tool songs, you're not going to get that, um, like K-Max video. I don't know how serious he was, but, um, yeah, because he's usually always at least got some sarcasm to him, but that's why we love him. But he ended it with a just put like, oh, by the way, the new two of is a little bit boring. And it's like, yeah, I could see why some people might feel that, you know. And hey, that's what it's all about with music. We all have different views on it and different opinions. So uh, if you were really, really waiting for this album and it didn't disappoint you, you know, lift up your expectations, then that's great. If you got a little down, you know, felt a little disappointed. I am, you know, I'm sorry you waited all this time, but, uh, hey, there's a lot of other really great bands out there. There's a new Swans album coming out in a bit, right? 
maybe that'll, you know, be something where you like. Um, yeah, plenty of other music to discover out there. Don't let um, one disappointing release from a band get you down too much. Anyway, I think that's all I'd say. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I did have an old video of me talking about all my other tool albums. I feel it's not on par with how I approach talking about music now. Um, but I've probably only made about like, three videos ever since because I post so infrequently. So, you know, might check that out while you're at it. Just watch me fanboy over some more prog metal that I just really dig. Uh, 